started. Thanks for recording, Betsy. Um, so we are all a little rusty on virtual learning. So it took us a few minutes to figure out how we could best share all our different screens with you guys. Um, but tonight I'll be presenting the slideshow that Joel and Sierra will be going through. And then if you see where Miss Little John's screen is, she's spotlighted on your screen right now. You should have a way to also click on her and maximize it. She's gonna be showing materials through her document camera um, as part of this as well. Um, so I'm gonna like, we're gonna work on remembering how to do all these things we had to do for so long. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. This is our second um, elementary specific uh, session of Montessori 101. And we're gonna talk about mathematics in the elementary years. So we are two hosts tonight are Miss Little John and Mr. Steinberg, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves quickly and tell a little bit about themselves and their background in Montessori and math. Should I start? Um, okay. I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, my name is uh, Joel. I go by Mr. Joel in the classroom. Um, I've been teaching uh, in Montessori. This is my 15th year. Um, and um, one of the things that drew me to Montessori was, was the mathematics piece. Um, as a kid, um, I was fairly strong with mathematics, but um, grew bored over time. Uh, uh, because I just saw it as memorization numbers, these equations, things that I couldn't really relate to life. And it, it just seemed to, to black and white. And um, I just got bored. Uh, by the time I was in college, I was happy to not have to do any math at all ever again. Um, when I decided to become a teacher, I went to go observe in a Montessori classroom. And the first thing that jumped out at me was the mathematics materials. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm being honest when I say it brought the color back into my life as, as in regards to mathematics. Uh, things started to become clear to me. Uh, things that I knew abstractly, I could see, I could visualize and touch and feel in a different way. Um, and now not only do I love math mathematics and teaching mathematics, but I'm often making math puzzles at home and, and the just, um, it's become a really big part of my life. So um, the Montessori math materials to me are just something amazing. So I'm really happy to be able to share a little bit of my um, interest in mathematics with all of you tonight. Thank you, Joel. Um, next, I am Sierra Little John. I go by Miss Little John. Um, I am in the low community. Story is kind of similar to Joe's. We all know we all had troubles with math growing up, um, but I love money. So that's what drew me into the math per se, but I never understood it really in school. Um, I've been in my story for about eight years now. So when I got to, I started off as a floater and assistant. So I got to see it at every level from primary to lower elementary to upper elementary. And I just gravitated to it instantly. Um, it was it was just right there. It was so easy to understand. And just like Joe now, it's, just, it's opened up so many new windows and doors. Um, out of everything in story, I would say the math area is my favorite. I love how it's so concrete and how you don't need the teacher to see your own corrections or your own mistakes. Like the material does it for you. Um, and it's good sometimes to see that as a kid. I wish I had the Montessori math material growing up because I understand how a lot of things that I do in math now, it starts to make sense to me now teaching it that I didn't understand when I was actually doing it within traditional schools. So I love the Montessori math piece. I love um, the Montessori concept. And you guys will get to see some of that concrete things that I'm talking about as we go through the presentation. So look forward to talking to you all more and answering your questions. So uh, we wanted to start off by talking about how uh, in lower elementary um, and then on into upper elementary, we build on the foundations uh, from primary. Um, in primary, the, the materials 
um, are so well designed. Um, and um, as you can see in these materials here, if you were to spend the time to count each one, uh, there, uh, there are 10 of each. Uh, the base 10 system is um, embedded in the primary materials. Um, and, and there's uh, a lot of the materials starting on primary are sensorial experiences that um, kind of naturally teach the children about mathematics and about how numbers work. Um, and the, uh, really in primary, the concrete foundations are really being laid uh, so that students um, are working with real quantities as opposed to abstract ideas of numbers. Um, and uh, there are definite instances where children in the primary uh, communities will be ready to start moving towards abstraction. So they might work with the material that we'll be talking about later called the stamp game, which is a passage towards abstraction. Um, but really they're working with sensorial experiences and um, building the concept of what a number is, um, how uh, looking for patterns in numbers and um, uh, understanding that base 10 system that we use in mathematics. Uh, Sierra, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Nope, that was perfect, Joel. Yep, so like Joel said, the primary is very um, sensorial and getting their hands on some of the materials and you guys will get to see throughout the presentation how a lot of them correlate or you can see how they transition from one step gradually into the next. So um, even though we don't necessarily get to this uh, story so early in the, the school year, um, the, in the lower elementary curriculum, uh, there are the, the, the cosmic curriculum, there are five great stories. And the fifth great story is the story of numbers. So uh, Maria Montessori believed that when we paint a big picture for children, um, they, they are more easily able to place information in a logical sequence. So the story of numbers um, is, is the story of how we got the numbers that we use today. Um, if you can click to the next slide um, and then click forward. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole story, but um, it, it's one of my favorite stories uh, in, of, the, of the five great stories. Um, but it talks about how numbers have been a part of uh, human history since we first uh, stepped on this earth and how we've needed to be able to talk about numbers in some way, whether uh, and, and compare numbers, uh, compare sizes. Uh, we, you needed to know what kind, what size animal you needed to have in order to feed your, um, your community, how many animals you needed to get. Um, and every society, uh, every human um, uh, so society tribe has some form of a number system. Those number systems can differ depending on what type of society they have, what type of numbers they need to use. Um, but we talk about how numbers have been discovered uh, or, or, um, in different civilizations and how um, through time humans have built on uh, the knowledge of the past to learn more and more about numbers and how number systems became more and more abstract and how we came to what you see at the bottom here, the zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, these digits, these numerals that we use today in, in our um, society. Uh, and we also talk about um, other number systems that, that other um, societies, uh, uh, um, uh, people that speak other languages that they use. Um, but that big picture, um, Kind of also helps children see all that needed to happen so that we could do all the things that we do today. Um, I, I don't know, Sierra, uh, Sierra if you want to add to the story, to that portion of the story, if there's something I missed. <laughs> <laughs> no, Joe, you did great. Um, yes, like Joe <laughs> said, and three things about a lot of these stories that we present uh, within the Montessori is we have uh, these big, huge charts. And you know, anything about the elementary child, they love to do big work and have massive work. So we have all of these charts to, they can really compare and see 
how over time numbers have changed and they can see it from the different civilizations, like Joel said, um, which is good as far as a visual. And it takes that you'd be surprised where it takes their minds to things that you wouldn't even expect, which is that further exploration piece that um, a lot of kids don't get to get to um, outside of a Montessori school. You go to the next slide, Megan. So, oh, yep, from concrete to abstract. Go to the next slide. Sorry, it's cutting off a little bit on my screen. Okay, so here you guys will see um, some of the materials you may have heard of, which is like the golden bees. We call them the golden bees. They're all the same color and they range. I'm going to flip my screen so you guys can see it in real time as well as when you're looking at it um, on the computer. So these are golden bees. They're all uniform, the same color. We have thousands, which you see there. Those are Thousands, and the children physically compare them to see that they all love each other. You have tens, where they'll know that the tens of 100, and they compare and make it all up. And then you have your units. You see that each unit makes up one, and 10 units makes one tip, and 10. Miss Little John, they just continue to do that comparison within the golden bees. Um, did you want to say anything? Yeah, you need to get a little closer to your mic, please. I'm sorry, can you all hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. You're welcome. So, I was just saying that the golden bees are there. All this particular material is all gold. I'm sorry, so I'm working on the floor and the table. But um, the golden bees are all golden. They're all unified. And I was saying that the kids can put them up to each other and see that 10, ten units equals one ten, and they can compare it. Okay, and then they can take the tens. Ten tens equals one hundred, and they can compare that to the thousands. So it's very physical, and they can do addition with the with the golden bees. They do um, subtraction with the golden bees, and then you move on to some of the other materials. Oh, before I move to the next material, Joel, did you want to say anything about the golden bees? Uh, no, I I just I I just love that, you know, when we say to a, a student three thousand six hundred forty two, and they get out three thousand six hundred forty two with the golden beads that. It, it, it really is 3,642, so they can see it, they can feel it, they can connect with it. It's not just this concept. It's uh, something that they can actually see and feel. Am I going to the next slide? And with the golden bees, they can compare that. So you'll see, I know everyone hears about the stamp game, the famous stamp game. The camera's kind of far. I'm going to try to move it as I speak. Let me know if you guys cannot hear me anymore. So you'll see with the stamp game, what they can see with the golden bees is you'll start to build out those categories. So you can have, and this is the visual part, whereas right here, you get the concrete, you get the material. Then you start going into categories and you can physically see what you're doing. The number is right there. So you have 2,600s, 7,10s, and 7 units. And children physically pull them out and see it and self-correct if they need to. Then you can have the cards to follow with the material so they can see how it's written. And you can do addition with this material. You can do subtraction with uh, the stack game. You can even do division with the stack game. Where you'll see these guys, where they do group division and they start sharing into groups. Joe? 
Um, no, uh, that that's that's a the stamp game is very popular. The kids uh, like it. It's a, a great transitional material between the golden beads and more abstract work with mathematics. Next slide, please. Yep, that's just another visual of the golden beads. It's talked about. It's showing that. Sorry about the camera. So yeah, th these all show the same quantity, two thousand six hundred forty-seven, uh, and uh, getting more and more abstract. Mm -hmm. It's moving further and further into abstraction. And then we have what we call the large bead frame. So this is the large B frame where you guys can see the same number presented. They had 2,607 tens and seven units. And it's just another form of manipulating the materials. They're all, if you guys will notice, are, are the same color. So then they, it gives them that visual that they stay inside their same categories. Uh, the greens are still the units, the blues are still the tens. The red is always the hundreds and the green is into the thousands. So they still recognize their categories and still recognize they're still moving from to the abstract. So eventually, we also have the paper, which is colored as well. And you'll see the lines, you'll see the units, the hundreds, the tens, and the thousands. So the children will get to see how they need to write their numbers. And this builds up their categories to know where they need to place their number when they're doing addition or subtraction. Um, you can do multiplication on here, and it's the same process. Joe, did you have anything to add about the large B frame? No, uh, if, if your child, the large B frame, I find to be a material that uh, is, uh, real, is really abstract. Uh, it, it can be challenging for the students to learn um, as opposed to some of the other materials, uh, but it's, it's good for them I, I like using it for them to for counting for the because uh, students can count by tens, but once they get past a hundred, uh, it can be pretty uh, challenging to count by tens. Same thing with hundreds, and this is a good material to help them learn how to count by tens and count by hundreds once they get past a hundred, uh, and once they get past a thousand. So it's really good for that. Yep, I agree, Joe. And it's also good for writing your numbers, keeping them organized, and knowing when you need to transition or go into your next category. Another thing is, this is another material that they have in primary, but it's smaller. So you just don't have all the categories. So they've seen the material before, so we just expand on it in elementary. Next slide, Megan. Yep, and we do have a question about decimal work. And I can't remember if that is in later in the slide. So I just want to flag that that's there and then we can come to it if we don't get to it on the slide. Okay, so once again, just showing the children um, another concrete way. So we have this mat, which everything you'll notice is everything is always uh, labeled and it's always the same colors. So they'll get to see that thousands are always in the front, units are always in the back, and they'll understand that it goes thousands, hundreds, tens, units. And you get to see it again with the beads. 2,000, every um, bead represents, every bead represents a different number. Every number represents a different color. Yeah. So 2,000, 600, 7, 10, 7 units. So no matter, even if they're in different categories, you'll see that those are both in seven. Education. which will match with the stamp game, which will match with the golden beads, which will match with the large bead frame. Uh, Joe, did you want to add? I anything? find that uh, um, in, especially in third grade, if a child is having trouble, second and third grade, if a child is have, having trouble making the transition to abstraction, this material, actually, the golden bead, uh, uh, golden bead material is a really great material to help them um, when they're doing operations like multiplication. Um, there's less to manipulate than the stamp game, less pieces, uh, and so it can help them make that transition a little bit easier. It's a, it's a good material for that.
And again, this is just a lot of repetition. Repetition is always good. So not only do they get a chance to see it with the beads and the actual material, but then they get to see it in actual cards. And once again, the cards are colored. Your thousands are green, your hundreds are red. So it's just, it's, it's, it's solidifying what you're doing. So it's that you already know that you're still in your right category and the cards are sized. So you guys get to see if you break this card down, it, it'll say 2,000, 600, 77. So you'll physically get to see 2,000, 600, 70 tens, and seven units. And the children love to put it back, which makes up that number. And then we move to the abstraction piece we're talking about. After doing all, all of the repetition and all the work, when you feel comfortable enough to start working on paper, you already know where your number should lie. And you move to paper. And a lot of children move fast because the, um, the material is so concrete that moving abstractly with a lot of different op operations is easy. You know, where some it will come a little bit more difficult, but because the material gives you all the information, it's so much easier when it's time for you to put it on paper, which is great because you get a lot of different opportunities and chances to do the same work, but just in different ways. But it's all following the same kind of procedures and steps. areas of mathematics. So we have a, we have the, the, the four normal um, areas, the number sense, the operations, the measurement, and fractions, and the algebraic concepts. Um, Sierra, I'm going to pause you for just a second. We do, I, there was a raised hand I just saw. Um, Sarah Morgan, you have a question? And you can unmute yes. yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, so as Joel was saying about how if a kid is struggling with a certain type of material that he might find it easier to introduce it to them in another material. How are y'all thinking about mastery of these different operations? Are you expecting that they will master it with all of the different materials you just demonstrated? Or like, would you count it as mastery if, as long as they're able to master the concepts with certain ones? Like, I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about that. Um, no, they do not have to master it with each and every material. Sometimes for different reasons, different materials don't work with particular students. Um, I've found sometimes the stamp games, the stamp game for some students can just be too much. Uh, I've had students who have like fine motor skill uh, um, issues with their fingers. And so laying out all the pieces for the stamp game can be problematic and it, it's more of a block than a help. So finding, you know, the gold, that golden mat um, is a little bit more abstract. And so we might have to, you know, at least make sure that they have a strong concrete foundation. But um, the golden beads uh, or the golden matte material with the colored beads is just something that's a little bit more easy to manipulate. So for that particular particular student, for instance, that material worked better for him. So it, it's a matter of kind of knowing what's working for the student, knowing if the student is ready for the material, but they, they don't have to master each and every operation on each and every material. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks so much. I would just yeah. add, Sarah, that I think it's an interesting thing to think about just the concept of mastery because we can go back and forth with this so many times where it's like, are we talking about the mastery of the material or the mastery of the concept itself? Because like we're thinking of the like, once you've reached that point of abstraction um, and application uh, as being kind of the point of mastery for a concept, 
Um, but like when we're talking about if a child's working on the stamp game, they might have mastered the concepts of how you work with the different way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can apply it yet. So, um, it always is such a nuanced conversation when we're talking about mastery and, and exactly what we're looking at for everybody. All right, Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. Are we done with this slide? Yes. And just to follow up on that point, I want to say a big part of it is probably process. So a lot of it is the process. Even if they don't master it, if they understand the process of why a number should be where it should be or why a B should be where it should be, then the mastery kind of comes in a later, little later. Sometimes it takes children to deal oh, with different materials on the same operation to see what makes it for them within whatever math they're doing. And Joe said the stamp game doesn't work for a lot of children with like addition and subtraction. I find the stamp game very helpful for division. So it just all depends on the child. And that's why I love Montessori because you're really meeting that child where they are. Summer, you go to the next one. Or, yep, so that's just the golden beads. So, these are the different. So, you see the children, if you see the one in the middle, that is a wooden hierarchical material in color. You have your, your cubes, your squares, your um, line, and your units. So, it's just reiterating it again units, hundreds, tens, thousands, which is a lot of repetition. Every time you, we all know within math, it's easy to get lost because sometimes we mix up our numbers or our categories and Montessori does a really good job of just reiterating in each material kind of the same steps in a way, whether it's by color or by the beads or by the process, you're just really getting that concrete example of what exactly um, you're doing. So you start with that wooden hierarchical material, what they see in primary, um, they also see a little bit of the golden bees and a little bit of the large bee frame. Um, and some of them have stamp games as well. So they get really get the chance to um, play with all of their numbers and categories. Yep, just more reiteration. I know a lot of you have heard about the 100 board. They love the 100 board. Um, and this is just the cards, the number cards I brought up, these right here, that's just putting it with the material, like with the snap game, so they could physically see when they're manipulating it, what those numbers actually look like if they were being written down on paper. See one of our students loving math, loving the different operations. So addition, multiplication, subtraction, division. Um, we have something here that you all may have heard about. This is the checkerboard. Once again, following those colors, um, they do multiplication on the checkerboard. That's the one we have for checkerboard over here. This is for our racks, is our racks and twos, which again, follow the same color sequence and we use this for division. Um, it follows the large B frame as well because you see units tens hundreds of the simple family and then uh thousand ten thousands hundred thousands and then um one million so it follows the same on the racks and tubes we have the simple family the thousands family and the millions family and then you'll see the full multiplication it goes all the way to the million as well sorry about this camera And we use, you can do snap game. You can use that for addition or subtraction. And then we move into some of the things that um, Joe will talk about later on, which we go to the algebraic, which we go into square the numbers, cubes the numbers, squaring and cubing, which our B cabinet follows the same colors as our um, B bars that we use for the different operations. So one is always red, two is green, three is four, and it follows the same with the B cabinet all the way up to nine. Joe, did you want to add anything about the operations? Just one thing I might say is like, uh, typically because um, testing uh, is asking for students to know about subtraction um, and, you know, first, second grade, and, and they should they should definitely know about it. But like, if I was to go with the most logical sequence in terms 
terms of what is most concrete for students. Uh, it actually, what I found is students actually transition much better from addition to multiplication than from addition to subtraction. Um, sometimes I, I allow the student to tell me which direction they would like to go. What, what do they want to know first? multiplication or subtraction. I actually find of the four operations, subtraction can be actually even more difficult than division. There's just something about it uh, when that that's a little bit more challenging and abstract when you're working with materials. Um, and so so if you have a child that's struggling with subtraction, just know that it, that's that's kind of common at this age. It, it can be challenging for the students. Um, uh, multiplication, if uh, when you if you were to see it done um, in, in in a concrete way, it it just follows so nicely from addition. That that's all I would mention. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Subtraction is very. I don't know why, but it tends to be um, a little bit more difficult. Children really gravitate towards the multiplication and the division, which you would think in traditional school that would be like the hardest to grasp, but it's so concrete that they love to do um, a lot of multiplication and a lot of division. They love the racks and tubes. It's very fidgety. They love to see. Um, so yeah, I would really agree with that. For some reason, it's a little bit hard to grasp. And I uh, I guess I'll up to I can show you guys what that looks like really fast. This little jump, can you come close to your speaker? I didn't have a different one, you can see. Oh, okay, good job. Here now. We're just breaking up a little bit. Okay, well, we could just continue. I guess I'll just, I, could, I was going to show an example, but I can show it at the end if someone wants to see it, but we could just continue if the mic is messing up. One of the things I can do, Megan, also is um, I, I, I should have a few videos from virtual learning from last year that I might be able to kind of share out. So it's kind of an electronic version of how it would work. Um, so, so we could maybe try to share that out later so they can see kind of some, some of the operations. Um, we can talk about that, Megan, but um, we can move into measurement and data. Um, so uh, measurement and data uh, is one of the real practical applications of mathematics. Um, I only um, had time to put uh, one slide with the rulers, but uh, we do go into other forms of measurement uh, in regards to weighing and temperature um, at volume. Um, uh, but but that was that's just a representation of one of the things that that we do. So um, they learn about the customer system and the metric system, um, and uh, we also um, get into time. And first grade, the students are really needing to make sure that they are understanding the exact hour and a half hour um, after that. Um, um, after that, they um, should start being able to tell the quarter hour, um, then every five minutes uh, up until the exact hour. And by third grade, they should be able to do problems involving elapsed time. Um, and uh, then we also do um, we also uh, do uh, graphing and data. Um, part of that is taking surveys, which is when uh, students. I, I'm, I'm sorry, here, uh, okay, okay. Um, uh, part of that is doing surveys where students go around uh, and they, they take data using tally marks and different methods of taking data um, to, to then put into um, a visual representation like a pictograph or a bar graph or things like that. So, and that's one of the things that the students enjoy doing most because it's kind of like uh, doing mathematics and socializing at the same time, which is, you know, really connects to their, to their interests. Um, money is also uh, something that is kind of in the realm of measurement data. It's kind of in the realm of operations. It kind of is, is, is in between. And, and that's one thing that, um, you know, is, is really nice about the Montessori math is all, it re really shows how the curricular areas connect with each other. Um, 
you know, when uh, Ms. Little John was talking about the uh, the hierarchical material that really connects to geometry, to uh, the point, the line, the the um, plane, and the solids. Um, so these things kind of intertwine and connect with each other. Um, so you can go to the next slide, uh, Megan. Um, fractions, uh, we, um, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Ms. Little John, if you do this, but one of the ways we start off with fractions is with uh, an apple or a fruit where we cut it in, in half and uh, then we cut into fourths and then the kids get to, to eat a, a portion of the apple and we talk about um, about you know how fractions are equal shares of a whole, um, and so they get kind of a concrete and um, uh, uh, concrete um, and sensorial experience of what a fraction is. Um, there are different um, representations of fractions that we have different materials. The one that's shown here are the metal insets, um, but uh, we do have other representations that we use. Um, but we always start with that concrete um, and sensorial experience. Ms. Little John is showing the uh, actual material there. Um, and then we build from that concrete uh, um, representation of a fraction, for instance, moving further and further towards abstraction. Um, uh, and then again, you know, here you see money again. Uh, so um, I usually get to this maybe uh, in around around second or third grade, uh, usually third grade, um, but showing the connection between uh, money and fractions as well, which then leads into the decimals. Somebody asked a question about decimals. Money is one of the places where we start to talk about decimals. Decimals, um, we can get into third grade, but decimals are often more of an upper elementary um, type of thing. Uh, if a student is ready for it, of course we go there. Um, that the act the the fraction or the decimal lesson is actually really really fun. Uh, involves a lot of cut, at least as I know it, uh, it involves a lot of cutting and um, and when you try to cut something into a hundredth or a thousandth, it, it can be pretty uh, a pretty great experience for the kids to see that happening. Um, but again, it's even with fractions, it's moving from the concrete representation towards the abstraction. And we also, of course, do operations with fractions in, in lower elementary uh, addition and subtraction. Usually when the denominator is the same, students can get to, uh, to having uh, different denominators in third grade. Uh, but again, that's more typically an upper thing. But if a student is ready for it, they, they'll get to it. Um, also fractions on the number line, um, which is a real abstract uh, concept. But um, there's materials that help get them to that point. Um, do you have anything to add, Sierra? No, I would just say when you said the addition and subtraction, yeah, totally agree. You can also do um, what they love about, what I love about the fraction material, it, like I said, it's super concrete. And when you, um, you can connect it to the multiplication of like a whole number, like a mixed fraction times a whole number. Um, break the pieces out and on top of the metal insects which is the harder you also have um we have a big variety of the plastic sets in the whole halves thirds fourths fifths that the children can do so they can go as big as they want with the fractions which they love um and like um joe said it starts small so you can start it with the four sets where you're just introducing what it looks like so you start with just a, a simple hole and you can see it's not broken up now, but it goes into halves. Then we have thirds, just again, giving them different impressions of the same information. And then fourths. So I, I like the fraction material as well. I think it's pretty great. Yeah, and, and the, the multiplication lesson, multiplication with fractions is actually really fun. <laughs> I mean, for <laughs> I find it to be fun anyway. Um, I enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can go to the, the next slide. Um, so uh, algebra actually starts in primary. Um, there is the binomial cube and the trinomial cube um, that the students work with in primary and they work again with in, in uh, lower elementary as well. Um, 
it it's uh, very rare that I've gotten to the point where I'm um, showing the uh, yes, there's there's the uh, binomial cube, Miss Little Jones showing. Um, I, it's very rare that I've been able to get to to uh, to showing that the um, actual equation of the cube of a binomial and the, the cube of a trinomial with a student, but sometimes students can get there. Um, but still, this this material right here they will see again in upper elementary. So this thing that they viewed as just a simple puzzle will come back around and um, will connect. Uh, so when they're up in upper elementary and they're doing this cube of uh, this, you know, abstract representation of a, the cube of a binomial or cube of a trinomial, there is this material that they worked with when they were three or four years old. It, it, it's kind of one of the most amazing things that I, I see that it all connects back to this work that they were doing years ago. Uh, and I think there's one more slide too. Um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so this right here is, um, is basically multiplying a binomial. Uh, we multiply binomials uh, uh, or trinomials or do squares of binomials, squares of tri uh, trinomials, and even a square of a decanomial. There's a decanomial um, layout that, um, that we, we get to in this, this um, this uh, in, in lower L that is a very long process for the kids, but the end result is is something that again ties back to primary when you build this tower with the cubes from the bead cabinet that uh, rep that is ex you know very similar to the pink tower that they worked with in primary. Um, but so that we have these um, there's a concrete way to do the you know, multiplying binomials and uh, multiplying trinomials, squaring binomials, squaring trinomials, that just kind of um, lays this concrete foundation for students that they can use later on down the road uh, in upper elementary and beyond. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Sierra. No, I was just going to say, and the, the best part about it is with Montessori, what I love is they all come with stories. So the sensorial pieces, we have a great story for each of the, the binomial, the trinomial, the quadrinomial, and it involves rulers and everything. So the children get really into it. It's a whole story behind it. So if the child gets to, I haven't really got to this part too, but like Joe said, they see it in upper L as well. Um, but it really draws them in. So once they get the story, then they get to put their hands on the material and then they physically get to put that to paper. So it's really like a step-by-step -step process, which um, is sweet. It just puts the cherry on the top, being able to hear a story, physically visual that story, and then touch the material to create that and then to build that out on paper. You know, it's some things that you would never think that you could even do in the third grade. I, I, I see a question about negative numbers. Um, there, is, there are materials for negative numbers, um, but I, I have not gotten to negative numbers in lower elementary with students. Um, I, I don't know about you. Um, it's more of an upper elementary thing. It's a pretty abstract concept. Um, there are students that could be ready for, for it and, and uh, um, could, could be ready to do it even in lower elementary, but I've just not come across students that have necessarily been ready for that uh, or, or um, you know, um, but it, it, it's possible. Uh, but there is a material, I don't have one here right now to, sh to show you. And I don't, don't know if you have one uh, to, to show right there. But um, another question <laughs> for, for Chris's friend, um, uh, I'm gonna, in the, in the chat, sh a binomial, put a binomial in there. That's the binomial. Uh, that um, here is a, uh, tr a trinomial. Um, right there. This is a trinomial. So um, that's a trinomial. Um, uh, and I don't know why it gets that name. You know. And then, yeah. Uh, yes. The, the, so that that's that's the the three plus four is the binomial. Three plus four plus five is a trinomial. Um, but this does lay the uh, foundation for algebraic thinking because you'll see often in algebra something like a plus b or a plus b plus c. So a plus b plus c would be a trinomial. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm glad your friend uh, got, got the help that they needed, Chris. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, so, so yeah, so um, that, that, I mean, that is really kind of like a, 
uh, fast uh, kind of rundown of uh, a lot of stuff that, and we couldn't even really touch too too much upon upper elementary because because that's just uh, there, in, in this amount of time it it doesn't necessarily allow for it. Um, but just know that there are concrete materials for um, that that are used in upper elementary to represent um, different different aspects of the upper elementary uh, curriculum as well. And then Sarah, did you find negative? We have some of the negative material even in yeah, your classroom, right? Yeah. I was about to say too, we do something called the snake game, but like Joe said, it's very rare that we'll get to negative numbers, but we use um, materials, I want the bees to fall out. Um, we have a lesson and it's called the snake game. That's the lesson, I mean, that's the name for the material. Um, and you're just building a snake and it's showing the children how to take it away and build it and replace it with black and white. One, rep one side represents positive number, one side represents negative numbers. Um, and they're just creating that. So all of the, you have um, ones with multicolors, some colors, and depending on if they're adding or subtracting the negative numbers, that's what we would use that material for. But it is pretty rare that you would get to it unless you are really interested into negative numbers. And then Sierra, do you have the decimal material to that do my decimal board is downstairs the upper elementary is using now i know i didn't know if you had it you guys no. yeah, I, I don't have the, the decimal board but i have the material that we use on the decimal board right i, I see kim's question about another material uh to purchase um um, one thing that I, I, when we were, went to virtual and I was trying to think of a, something that a, a students could make at home. Oh, I, is that, I'll, I'll pause and then let Sierra show that for the decimal material. That, yeah, Sorry, that's yeah. the material. Yeah, but you'll see even the cards have decimals in them. I don't want to fall. I don't know if that's clear. So you'll see the cards. Um, we have cards with decimals in them. And without, and then each of these represents one of the decimal cards. Let's see. Once again, we're going with those categories. The the decimal material, Megan, is in some ways similar to the stamp game. Um, mm -hmm. in, in some in some ways. Uh, um, but it, there's a, there's some lessons that lead up to it um, that that help show what what decimals are and, and connect. You know, decimals are actually types of fractions. So um, con connecting fractions and decimals, there's a there are lessons, especially as you get into third grade. But but um, uh, more often up in, in upper L that connect uh, fractions to decimals. Um, I saw uh, Kim had a, a question about what materials to purchase. Um, when when we went to virtual, I had this kind of vision um, that if 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 some if you could get uh, quite a bit of pennies, quite a bit of quite a few dimes, and some dollar coins, um, that that actually is the decimal system: pennies, dimes, and coins. And it might be fascinating for kids to work with pennies, dimes, and coins, uh, and dollar dollar coins, um, which which. Uh, with you could use that to do kind of like the stamp game, any 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 type of mathematical problem up into the uh, at least into the hundreds place. Um, you could get some ten dollar bills if you wanted to, but that there there's a level of abstraction that you need for that um, to get to get to the thousands place. But um, for a little bit of money going to the bank and getting getting access to that, you could you could do you could uh, get you know, kind of make your own stamp game with with some money if you wanted to have that to, to work. Um, so um, I, I, I'm trying to think of other materials. Uh, Sierra, do you have any suggestion of other materials that students could have at home that might help? I mean, a stamp game is great to have at home. No, I was just about to say about that with the checkerboard. I mean, if you wanted to create the checkerboard, you just follow those colors and add those categories and um, to make it's the same thing. The decimal board is the same as the checkerboard, but it just shows that it just has a, another side with for the decimals with these same colors. So it's the exact same as the checkerboard, but it's just bigger with these colors on the opposite side, well above it. 
so that you could flip and slide. I mean, so many things you can create at home if you're crafty or, you know, but a lot of Montessori materials are a little pricey um, in my opinion. But a lot of these, if you follow the same color coordinated, you can still do a lot of these same things at home, like a red, a green, a blue. Even if you're drawing them and having them draw them, same thing. Or if you guys have, um, I, I know it's not that much to um, purchase colored beads and you can follow the same sort of operations if you want to practice that. And then I would just throw out there because yes, not to trump um Annie's uh made bead frame from home last year but um for those East End folks on the call that are new to elementary this year last year during virtual um we did a big push to like get materials into kids hands at home and so we do still have extras of those things as well so I can touch base with Ebony and Carly um and also like depends like obviously when I talk to her Sean and Joel about what specifically people are working on but we did a lot of like creative ordering of like fraction pieces that could come apart and like colored beads. And we did have large beads. We do have a lot of extra large bead frames too, when we were trying to replicate things that people could make at home and kind of like at home stamp games and things like that too. Um, so, cause I don't want anybody spending their money uh, going out to buy those cause we can help you figure out how to do them or um, watch a YouTube video on them. And I, I uh, see, uh, yeah, two good questions. Uh, uh, you saw. I saw that. Well, Suzanne mentioned that by upper L, kids are less interested in working with materials. I think that's probably probably true. I think oftentimes what happens is the teachers like will present necessarily a material to kind of show that concrete foundation, then probably move them pretty quickly into abstraction because they're they don't have the time <laughs> that uh, they don't want to take the time to uh, manipulate all those materials, but. Um, uh, and then there was a question, what are the minimum concepts a student needs to be prepared for upper L? Um, they should uh, be able to add and subtract abstractly, uh, begin to multiply abstractly one digit multipliers, um, not necessarily two or three digit multipliers, but it, they could be ready for that by, by upper L. But to be in, ready for upper L, be, uh, they should probably be able to um, multiply uh, abstractly, you know, uh, one, one digit multipliers. Division, um, if they can do long division, that's a strong foundation, um, or at least be ready to receive a long division lesson once they get to upper L. Um, they should probably know their addition and subtraction facts uh, and their multiplication facts. Uh, division facts, I think, is something that they could, could get more, but once you know your multiplication facts, if you should probably understand inverse operations, which means you understand your division facts anyway. So, um, uh, and then um, there, I mean, those are kind of the basics that we can get into it more if we had more time. I don't know, Sarah, if there's something big that I'm missing um, about that. Nope, you hit right on the nose. I mean, basic facts by the time they honestly by the time um a lot of our students you can start to see their transition by the time they're in third grade they're kind of over the material so they're ready to do the big abstract work on paper so we're just building those foundations so by the time they get to upper l it's just solidifying everything that they already did with the materials throughout those three-year cycles um and, and antoinette then... i see your question about pre-k four to k um, and I will say that there is a parent ed night next week on math in the primary environment that's going to go through all of the basically similar to this presentation tonight, but that will talk through all the specific concepts in primary um, and give you an idea of what children are working on with suggestions at home as well. Um, so much that I can say right now, though, is just the the matching like symbol with the actual quantity is like a big piece of elementary understanding our number system um one through ten yep next thursday february 3rd that wasn't a plant for those of you <laughs> with primary parents and then joel do you want to answer sarah morgan's question about geometry since we talked about that so much too yeah 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 i mean we we originally the idea was for us to do math and geometry but then we just realized that in an hour, that's just not possible. I, I would definitely consider geometry 
uh, a part of mathematics. Um, to me, geometry is the beautiful part of mathematics. Um, geometry is where you get to really see uh, how beautiful mathematics is. Um, and that's one thing that like, I definitely would like to emphasize that um, I, I, I definitely want all of my students to become the strongest mathematicians that they can be. But more than that, I want my students to love mathematics. Like if, if you know, I don't want what happened to me to happen to them who I was, again, a strong mathematician who had the joy for mathematics sapped out of me. Um, so I first, one of the things that, that, you know, teachers in Montessori really try to do is just kind of bring joy to mathematics and show them the beauty. And, and that's one of the great things about the materials is they're so beautiful and they show these amazing patterns. Um, and so um, we, we definitely want our kids to be the strongest mathematicians, but I, you know, at home, you know, my, another part of it, I love my dad, but my dad did not have patience for me when we were doing mathematics. And that was part of it. Um, have patience with your children if they're not understanding something and because it can be hard and, and, and uh, it can be frustrating. So we, we really want to make sure that the students uh, keep that joy. Um, and, and in my opinion, that's more important than, than, than how strong a mathematician they are. I don't know if you would uh, want to add or anything, Sierra. No, I'm just saying, because sometimes the children don't know that they even, sometimes uh, the great thing about Montessori is they're doing this big work and don't even realize that they're doing it. Whereas I feel like well, for us doing math, you know, when we were in school, it was drilled into us, like Joel said, and your parents were over it, you were over it, it was just unbearable. Whereas in Montessori, they could be do some of these big concepts and not even realize that they're doing them, which is the great piece. So they're falling in love with it. You know, it's not it's not stressed or um, it's like, oh, you have to get this right. No, erase that. No, the material is going to tell you if you made a mistake or not. And you'll immediately know, OK, I need to fix this or something isn't right in order. And you fall in love with it even more. So that how you build that love of math up which is great because we need more math lovers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I put a question in the chat about if people would be interested in attending a night on geometry. We do have some open topics left for, looks like people are in for it, great. Geometry in Montessori is so fantastic. Um, so I think uh, that would be great. So it's good to hear that there's some enthusiasm. Um, we'll definitely will be doing language um, coming up as well, um, the, especially the grammar area of elementary. Um, so those are things to come for sure. Um, any last minute questions? And then we'll close out. Um, this is recorded. Um, so we will share it out with you guys as well. Um, and then obviously follow up questions. You can feel free to send to me or Ebony or Sierra and Joel as well. Those of us making the transition from primary to elementary next year, are there going to be any sort of sessions to support us in that? And if not, would it be possible to reshare uh, how, like, some recommended recordings of other parent family university sessions that, um, if we're interested in better understanding what our kids will be experiencing um, next year, yeah, that we can take a look at. For sure. We have the introduction to like cosmic education, which is the introduction to elementary that we can definitely reshare out. And then we tend to do when we get a little bit more into spring and the time when people are thinking about the transitions, um, some more like targeted um, time with the elementary. Um, and, you know, we'll, we all talk a little bit more about that look, what that looks like when we get there. But um, we have a very special process from transitioning from kindergarten to first grade. Now that we have um, elementary classrooms at East End too, we'll walk them into that tradition. All right, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you so much, Joel, Joel and Sierra for this um, wonderful math presentation and putting it together. Um, and thank you guys all for attending.